ACW is sponsored by Jabadi. Self-care through skin care. Jabadi is for everybody. Welcome listeners. Welcome to ACW Podcasts. Thank you for joining us today. I am Robin Gabriel Parson, your host, and my co-host today is Natalie Pearson. Now, we're going to talk about heart health uh, in reference to the awareness around heart health. Our discussion about heart health is something that is needed. Uh, many times people don't realize heart disease is one of the leading diseases that are really affecting so many people. Now, we love with our heart. We feel with our heart. We make life choices with our heart, good or bad. The heart gives us life, but yet is the most at-risk organ in our body. When the body is plagued with other health disparities, the heart always feels the effects. How do we take care of our heart health? Well, today I will introduce a very, very, very dear friend and family. Been knowing her for over 30 years, and we're going to talk about how to take care of the heart. Now, my co-host, Natalie Pearson, she is a heart failure coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania. She works with patients with heart disease, and she is an American Heart Association volunteer and advocate. Let's welcome my sister, my friend, Natalie Pearson. Hi, Robin and everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you so much for that warm welcome. But like Robin said, I am a heart failure coordinator. I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse. Um, and I've been a nurse for over 30 years now. I'm a proud graduate of um, Charity School of Nursing. But um, over the years, I've changed my focus from just treating patients with heart disease to preventing heart disease. And I have to say that focus came about 10 years ago when I decided to go back to school and pursue my master's in community system ad administration. So I can uh, focus more on, again, the prevention of heart disease. So like Robin said, our heart is very important. We do so much with our heart. And so we can only take care of our heart. So thank you again, Robin, for having me here. I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about this very important topic. Thank you, Natalie, for just sharing all of your amazing knowledge with us today. Natalie, um, please share with us the stats around heart health when it comes to the African-American population. You know, as always, um, I'm always excited to share that information, and that's always a good question. But I have to tell you, with all the advancement of medication and technology and the management of heart disease, and American population as a whole, we're living, they're living longer. However, this same benefit is not seen in the Black and other minority communities. Unfortunately, Black continue to experience a higher death rate due to heart disease and stroke. Black experience nearly 30% higher death rate from heart disease as opposed to their white counterparts, and also 55% higher rate of stroke compared to whites. Blacks and other um, minorities are significant, significantly more likely to die while being treated in the hospital um, for heart disease. And this goes into another topic of discussion when you talk about health disparity and health inequity. Why is that? But heart disease occurs earlier in a black population than a white, white counterpart. Before the age of 50, blacks are 20 times more likely to develop heart failure than their white counterpart. And when I say heart failure, I mean like their heart is not pumping out effectively. Um, it's not pumping out effectively. So that's a significant increase at a young age. Wow, wow, that's very interesting. Throughout our podcast, we've been talking about stress, stress, stress. And right now within our COVID environment, there's so much stress that is being felt. I was listening to a newscast the other day and they were talking about the two leading issues of death right now is COVID and heart disease. And it kind of really blew my mind. And as you mentioned, who is the greatest risk of dying from heart health? disease is the African-American population. Now, Natalie, do you feel this has a lot to do with our environment, what we're dealing with every day, the stressors in our life? 
I think it's a combination of reasons why um, African Americans are more affected by heart disease than any other population. Some of it could be some of the modifiable risk factors such as high blood pressure, um, diabetes, obesity, but still a large portion of it is still with our social determinants of health, meaning some of our environmental factors that can affect our heart disease. And that's, a, a, we're finding more and more those outside stimulus plays a big part on how well we do as a culture. And you're, you're absolutely right. Stress has a huge impact on how we're doing. And speaking of this COVID environment, not to get off the subject a little bit, but we're, it's, COVID is, um, has um, consumed our lives. And what's happening, what we see a lot in, in our practices, we're focused on COVID and it's affecting our other problems because we're not seeking medical help because of fear of the COVID virus. And that, that impacts our, our outcome as well. Now, Natalie, um, symptoms of heart disease, because a lot of people don't know they're walking around with heart disease. Let's talk a little bit about the symptoms. You know, the symptoms of heart disease um, is sometimes really tricky because we may not have always have symptoms of heart disease. You know, again, I'm talking about high blood pressure because um, high blood pressure is one of the leading cause of heart disease in the black community. And high blood pressure is called the silent killer. It's not the silent killer for no reason, but the problem is sometimes we may not have symptoms of high blood pressure until our, high, our blood pressure has been high for a number of years and over time. And by the time we start experiencing the symptoms, you know, damage has already occurred. So some of the symptoms may not show to later, later in life. And the same thing with a stroke. And when you talk about um, coronary artery disease or plaque building up, plaque builds up over time and sometimes the result of the plaque buildup may be a stroke and that could be the symptom of what has been a long time effect. But heart disease um, in women, and that's one of the reasons why I really got involved with the American Heart Association, because we talk about health disparity among races and ethnic group, but we also have to talk about the health disparity and the difference between gender. So women, when you talk about symptoms specifically, women's symptoms of a heart attack are usually much different than men. It's not your typical chest pain, I'm coming to join you, Elizabeth, you know, symptoms that you sometimes see or you remember from Fred Sanford, for those old, old enough to remember that. But sometimes, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but sometimes the, the symptoms for heart disease in women are very subtle, like nausea, vomiting, more GI, fatigue, feeling, not feeling themselves. So as women, we need to be our biggest advocate when something's not right or something feels not right. We need to seek that medical attention and listen to the signs that our bodies are telling us. Now, when you say women, again, I, I, I have to kind of look at the African-American population. Do you find more women of color are dealing with heart disease more so than our counterpart? That most definitely. So when I say gender, so if you add being of color that increase your risk even more. So when you talk about women being undiagnosed or underdiagnosed or undertreated, just increase those rates among African-Americans and other minorities. Again, that goes into the health inequities and disparity that we see among the race. So it's a problem along gender line, but also it's a, you add increased problems along the racial or ethnicity line as well. Now, what I find interesting, I'm just going to kind of share something when it comes to women and heart health. And I've heard um, some of my wellness colleagues talk about how things have changed compared to when our mothers were mothers at home. More women are in the workforce. More women are taking on serious household matters. Um, a lot of single parent mothers. So it, it almost kind of like, you know, the woman... Uh, the, the empowering women is great, but is it really the best thing for our health when now that things are changing and a lot of us are out there in the workforce, so it's like a lot more stress. So I just kind of wanted to share that. I just think also the signs of time is really changing this whole um, paradigm when it comes to women's health. Um, just kind of collaborate on that. Do you think because more women are in the workforce, more women are taking on responsibilities that back in the day that they really didn't have to take on. I agree with that, Robin, 100%. I mean, we, um, we're taking on, it's more stress, it's, it's more 
um, more responsibility. We are caregivers. We are so busy caring for other people. And sometimes we neglect to care for ourselves because again, we're our, our ten, attention and focus is caring for others and also carrying a burden of so many other responsibility. And stress plays a, a huge role in our overall heart health. Yes, yes, definitely. Now, Natalie, why is it important for an individual to manage that blood pressure, that cholesterol, uh, their blood sugar levels? Are there numbers? Why is it so important that we pay attention to those aspects of our health? You know, like I said before, high blood pressure is the number one cause of heart disease. And that's one of the most modifiable risk factors. As when you talk about high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and cholesterol, all those things are very important. And one of the things I like to tell people is it's important to know your numbers. And when we're talking about knowing our numbers, we're talking about the, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, your blood sugar, because all those numbers can affect your overall health. Um, and when you your your Cholesterol, we want to make sure your cholesterol is less than 200. And like I said before, you don't, a lot of times we don't know when our cholesterol is high. But if you go to your doctor, have your cholesterol checked, and ask the doctor, what is my cholesterol? So you will have some knowledge of it and to be more of an active participant in your health care. So by decreasing your cholesterol, you can also decrease the narrowing of and blockages in your arteries that can sometimes cause heart attacks and strokes. By decreasing your blood pressure, you also decrease the resistance that your heart has to work against that's causing more damage and um, decreasing the oxygen demand of your heart. You want to decrease that demand that your heart is putting on the rest of your body by decreasing your blood pressure. And also diabetes. Diabetes is a brutal illness that affects all your systems. And if you have diabetes, you have a two to four greater, two to four times greater chance of having heart disease than someone who does not have diabetes. So again, having those numbers under control is a huge help for your overall well-being. And I'm not sure about I said about weight, but you know, maintaining a healthy weight is also important because again, that can affect your overall heart health as well. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. And you know, Natalie, I just want to add to that. Um, when you, as an individual going to a doctor, something you said is very important. Asking your doctor what those those numbers mean. What is cholesterol? Having that conversation with your doctor. That that is what you pay them for. And I find a lot of times people are afraid to ask questions when they go to the doctor's office. Um, not sure how people, how often people have their biometric screening done, but it's important if you can do it annually and share that with me. How often should a person check their cholesterol or their blood pressure or their blood sugar level? You know, Robin, you're absolutely right. Having a conversation with, our doc with doctors can sometimes be very hard for patients. And I'm, I think it's so important to feel empowered to do this because they're working for you ultimately. <laughs> and, you know, and you should be an active participant in your health care. And having them tell you my blood pressure is good is not good enough. What is good? Because now the guidelines for blood pressures have changed. It's no longer, you know, 130, 140. Now the good blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. That being said, it really depends on the individual. If you talk to some cardiologists or some doctors for older population, they may want to stay a little bit higher, more than 130. But at any rate, the conversation you want to have with your doctor, what is my normal? And why is that normal? Understanding the numbers, like what should my cholesterol be? And tell me why. It's okay to ask why. And if they don't, if you don't understand the why, ask again. Because sometimes... Medical technology is a different language. It's like speaking a foreign language and, and you don't always understand. And no, the and only way that we know you don't understand is to ask that why, or can you repeat that again? So it's very important. And as far as how often you should have it done, it really depends on your situation, your medical history. If your blood pressure is borderline, it's a, like, I'm gonna give you an example. If your blood pressure is like 140 over 90, some of the um, recommendation is for you to try to do some lifestyle modification modification, continue to monitor your blood pressure at home. And then after a few months of lifestyle modification, meaning like exercise and diet and um, no alcohol or drink, uh, or smoking, then you may have to be on medication or, you know, some other changes. So it really depends on 
your what's going on. But usually once a year is recommended for those biometrics, like Robin said, like your hemoglobin A1C, your blood sugar, your cholesterol panel, um, and definitely blood pressure checks should be done several times a year. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Now, Natalie, there is a program that you are volunteering from, and I, and I just love your passion around this uh, healthy heart advocation and working with the Heart Health Associ uh, Association, Natalie, that is really, really wonderful that you're out there doing community work. And we want, I want to talk more about, you know, your passion behind that. And also, I want to talk about how you were able to help an interfaith community with heart health. So tell us more about this Life Simple 7 wellness program that the American Heart Association has. And it's a free program and you're right there in the community making sure people are introduced to this program. So tell us more about that. You're right, Robin. I'm really, I, I love this. Life Simple 7. I mean, one of the problems I have as healthcare professionals, we always tell people what they can't do. And it's so much better if we tell, it's so much easier if somebody tell me what I can do. So you think about it. Somebody tell you, I'll give you a guide to decrease your um, cardiac risk by 20%. Would you, would you do it? A decrease your cardiac death by 20%. Sounds like a good plan to me. So that's what Life Simple 7 is, is give you seven small steps to make big changes. If my husband was listening to me, he'll probably cringe because all I talk about is lifestyle modification. I don't talk <laughs> about diet. I just talk about lifestyle modification. He always say, no one says it like you, but, and that's true. It's, it's nothing complicated. It's like seven simple steps. I'm gonna start with one of the steps, staying active. Staying active doesn't mean you have to join a gym and run a marathon. Staying active means just 30 minutes of exercise a day. And that 30 minutes can be divided up in 10 minutes increment. And when I say a day, I want to change that to five days a week, a total of 150 minutes a week. That's the recommendation, 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise, and that could be walking. You know, one of the things I do to increase my steps or my exercise and is when I go to work, I actually park on the fifth floor. Going down the steps is much easier. I know I have to walk up those steps and I don't park on the fifth floor and take the elevator. I park on the fifth floor and take the steps or I take steps whenever they're available. So little lifestyle modification like that can make a huge difference. A second um, step could be controlling your cholesterol. As I mentioned before, controlling your cholesterol is very important to, de to decrease the, the plaque from building up in your bloodstream that can lead to stroke and heart attacks. So by decreasing that, we can eat like more fruits and vegetables, grain. And when I say vegetables, I'm not talking about piling all the butter and, and cheese on the broccoli, but you know, healthier options like that and healthy grains can really make a difference. Again, going back into the eating better eating better, incorporating more veggies, lean meat, whole grains, managing our blood sugar, number four. I'm sorry. Yeah, manage our blood sugar. I can go with that as out of order, but managing your blood sugar is very important. And as I mentioned before, two to four times more likely to develop heart disease if your blood pressure is uncontrolled. Controlling your blood pressure, knowing your numbers, in order for us to control it, we have to know what it is. So maintaining that healthy blood pressure and asking, 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 I can't say that enough, asking your healthcare provider, what is my normal? I'm telling you now, a blood pressure of 150, maybe it's better than that 160, 170, that's not normal. And you wanna ask, what can I do to make it better? Maintaining a healthy weight is another great thing. We have to, we hate to look at the skill, but not looking at the skill doesn't make the weight go down. We have to really maintain a healthy weight. Studies have shown if your abdominal circumference is 30, greater than 35 for women, that increase your risk of heart disease. And number seven, which is a big one, no smoking. The risk of smoking can increase your heart disease risk tremendously. So these are all modifiable risk factors by taking these seven simple steps can decrease your heart disease for about 20% or your cause of death. So they are very important. So the listeners, our listeners, in reference to those simple seven, life simple seven, can they actually go to the American Heart Association website and look at the seven very important practices? And because it's, it's a free program. So where, where, do, where should we direct them so they can basically, you know, look at these seven simple steps and apply them? 
Or you can go right to the American Heart Association. Just put in your search engine, Life Simple 7, American Heart Association. They, you can pull up PDF files for each one of those lifestyle modifications. If you don't smoke, that's great. So that's one thing you don't have to focus on. But if you're trying to figure out ways to improve or increase your activity level, definitely the Life Simple 7 is very detailed um, steps of what you can do and why. I think it's important. It's good to know what you should do, but it's also more important to know why you should do it. So if you go in a Heart, American Heart Association, Life Simple 7, you'll be able to pull up some, some information on exactly why and how you should do these simple steps. Now, I, I want to talk more about your volunteer and your, your advocacy in the community. I was so impressed when you talked to me about how you were able to implement this program within your interfaith community. What type of challenges did you have when you actually was able to go into an interfaith community and offer this uh, program? You know, I think if we look at trying to change the system as a whole, it's overwhelming. Um, it's funny, I just gave a talk and I said, before we can make change, we have to look at the change we can make among it within ourselves. And Michael Jackson said it best. You have to look at the man in the mirror first. So how can I, what can I, can, what can I do to be an example to others and how my action can help inspire others to, others to make a change? So when you look at the African-American community, black community, or any um, interfaith organization, there you have a core group of people together. And that's a, a, a central meeting spot. You know, every Sunday they go there, they, you know, they, they meet with their church. And it's outside of the walls of the hospital. It's out of the walls of the clinical setting. It's out of the walls of, like, the healthcare establishment where people sometimes have mistrust for and they don't want to go there to seek help. So I went where the people were. So I think it's important to go where your community is to spread awareness and educate. So what started off a few years ago is just me offering to do a blood pressure screen one Sunday in February. And to be honest, we weren't sure how to handle this. Wasn't sure if it was be well received. What's the liability, the logistics of checking somebody's blood pressure and the blood pressure is high? Um, so that was a big question. So I had to go around that and explain to my church heads of you know why I was doing it and how it's just a screening process. I think we need to start with screening and being aware of it. Well, that one Sunday a month led to four Sundays, or however many Sundays in a month of February, the whole month of February. And then it led to a whole ministry. So right now we're on our first year, kind of put on hold with COVID, but we've been doing a lot of stuff remotely, but introducing health awareness issues to our congregants. And we found people are more interested than they were not interested. And not just about heart health, but also about overall well-being, talking about cancer screening, just screening and overall better health as a whole. Now, when we talk about Life, Life Simple 7, of course, it was the American Heart Association, but if you think about it, those seven, those seven simple things can help you not only with heart health, but diabetes, cholesterol, your overall well-being. So that's amazing to me how it started off with one Sunday doing blood pressure screening with two people, and now it's a whole ministry with about 12 people. So um, we're really excited about that. And just add to that, one of the things we did with the University of Pennsylvania, we started off with just going out to different um, long-term living facilities to check blood pressure. But I found that wasn't as effective because we didn't have a chance to build relationships. So we changed that the following year and we went to a faith-based organization, went to a church one Sunday a month and we did blood pressure screening. And what we showed, what we saw was the congregants, they developed trust with us. They, you know, trust that they didn't have with their doctor on a regular basis. They now understand it was more educated. So they was more willing to be adherent to the medical therapy that was recommended by their doctor. So I think it's so important to just go into the community, go where people are and educate them, explain to them why certain things are needed. And I think that increased adherence. Thank you, Nellie. And I think that's a beautiful advocacy, what you're doing within the church community. And you said it perfectly. It was a trust factor. They felt safe in that community. They can trust you instead of going into a clinic or a hospital. And I feel that as a wellness professional or anybody in the medical field, if you can 
find a community that you're involved in. And if you have those expertise and the knowledge, then why not share? Why not save people? You don't always have to save people at work. <laughs> you know, you can do it within your community based on your knowledge and your skills. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing. And I'm hoping the listeners are taking in. And if we have any listeners out there who are in the health um, field, if you have a, a church family, Use those experiences and those and, and the skills and help because so many people, uh, again, don't really trust the medical community. So if you can take people out of that and wherever you are and share that information, that is so powerful. So I, I really thank you for that. So Natalie, before we leave, I just want to do that list of Simple 7 and give people yeah. again a, a direction to go to look for the Simple 7 and just any information they may need, how they can get to that uh, website. So can you just list those simple seven um, practices again for me? Please? Okay, the seven simple steps to big changes. One, get active. Two, collect, control your cholesterol. Three, eat better. Four, manage your blood pressure. Five, maintain a healthy weight. Six, reduce your blood sugar. And seven, stop smoking. And you can go to the American Heart Association and Life Simple 7, and you can have a lot of information in the area. Thank you so much. So listeners, thank you for joining us today. Again, I ask everyone, please live life with purpose, intention, and love. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Robin, for having me. Thank you, guys. ACW is presented by Partnerships in Fitness, a fitness and health and wellness consulting group, building strong minds and bodies, and empowering one community at a time. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our Piff Nola YouTube channel and leave questions or comments. ACW is sponsored by Javadi. Self-care through skincare. Javadi is for everybody.